Okay, I'm going to give you a little paper. I'm going to give you a little talk. That was the arrangement. And then I want to open the floor to discussion. If you uh, listen to it, you will understand that the emphasis of this paper, and it's a kind of, it's a collapsed version of something that I've been working on for some time, which is what, what are the origins of creativity? You know, where does it come from? So the, the, the talk is called Why One Story and Not Another. You will also, if you are writing people who have participated in writing workshops, which I have occasionally been part of, but I am not a, that's not, you know, something I do regularly. And I've discovered that people have, people are very, very craft oriented. And they, you know, they think there are rules for how this is supposed to go. I am coming from a whole other position. Just be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so it's called Why One Story and Not Another. Why One Story and Not Another. For the fiction writer, any and all stories are possible. Theoretically, there are no restrictions. If I wish to write a story about a child who grows wings and a tail at age 13 and flies into another world, no one will stop me. I am entirely free. But that is not my question. Why does a story feel right or wrong while I am making it? How do I know that a character must smash another character over the head at this juncture in the narrative? And conversely, why do I know that the paragraph I have just written is false and must be erased and redone? I am not talking about changing sentences to make them more elegant or cutting out a paragraph after reading a text because I realize the story can do without it. Such alterations belong to editing, and usually I can explain my decisions. I am asking where fictional stories originate and what guides their creation. Why, as a reader, do some novels feel to me like lies and others feel true? I think these are significant questions that are seldom asked. There is, however, a related question, one universally maligned and ridiculed by writers around the world, a question which dogs every novelist at countless events because someone out there in the audience inevitably asks it, but the dreaded question, regarded as the province of morons, is actually profound. The question is, where do you get your ideas? The word idea catapults us instantly into philosophy. What does it mean to have an idea? What is an idea? For Plato, ideal forms were more real than our world of flux and perceptual sensation. For Plutarch, an idea was by its very nature bodiless. Descartes posited thought as the only verifiable aspect of human existence and separated body and mind. Contemporary philosophers and scientists are busily doing their best to smash the Cartesian divide between spirit and matter. But what is the relation between our ideas or th thoughts and our feeling, sensing bodies? Where do ideas come from? The mind-body question appears as soon as the person in the back of the room asks me or any other writer on tour where our ideas come from. Our ideas in brain tissue. I have discovered that even when presented in highly lucid language, readers have difficulty grasping the problem. In my book, The Shaking Woman or A History of My Nerves, I pose the question again and again from multiple perspectives, and yet I was amazed to find that in interviews about the book, my interlocutors ignored it entirely. I will try to articulate the problem yet again.
As a culture, we are so deeply inculcated with the idea that mental faculties, thoughts, ideas, memories, fantasies, and feelings are different in kind from physical faculties, walking, running, having stomach aches, farting, that bridging the divide makes little sense to most people, and rather than think about it, they avoid it altogether. The problem of dualism, made famous by Descartes, cogito ergo sum, through which he proposed that we are two things, intellect and body, not one, was articulated beautifully in 1664 by the natural philosopher Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle, whose radical works were mostly ignored or ridiculed in her own time because she was a woman. This is Cavendish. I would ask those that say the brain has neither sense, reason, nor self-motion, but that all proceeds from an immaterial principle distinct from the body, where their immaterial ideas reside, in what part or place in the body. Cavendish's question remains urgent. Indeed, we all know that a head injury or dementia can make us forget who we are can change our personalities, our ideas, and thoughts. We know that the psychological and the physiological are not unrelated. And yet, how the private inner subjective experience of ideas, thoughts, and memories is connected to the objective reality of brain anatomy, neuronal connections, neurochemicals, and hormones remains unanswered. There is no agreed upon theoretical model for brain mind function. There are huge amounts of data. And there is a lot of theoretical speculation and guesswork. Some ideas strike me as better than others, but that does not mean we have figured it out. The next time you pick up a newspaper and read about the neural correlates or neural underpinnings or neural representations of fear, joy, sex, or anything else under the sun, you can say to yourself, ah, the words, correlates, underpinnings, and representations are used because the scientists and philosophers are reluctant to say that those brain systems are fear, joy, sex, or anything else under the sun. The words expose the gap between mind and body rather than close it. I cannot solve the division for you, but I can say there is a strong return to the body in many disciplines. Some cognitive scientists are abandoning the metaphor that has held sway since the late 60s, that our brains are like, or literally are, computational machines, information processors. The brain is a moist organ inside a body, and the computational metaphor has failed to cover many aspects of brain-mind function, our bodily movement, something as simple as how we walk, for example, as well as our emotions and feelings. The writing of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, the French phenomenologist who emphasized embodiment, has seen a resurgence both in the sciences and the humanities. From this point of view, where do you get your ideas? Must involve an embodied self or being. Ideas, too, are embodied. So how can we think about where the ideas for stories come from? How do we frame the question? It is common to point to writers' biographies, if even a remote connection between writer and novel can be found. Many writers have robbed their own lives and the lives of their families and friends for material. This is undeniable. And yet, the art of fiction cannot be reduced to a writer's autobiography. Nevertheless, stories must come from somewhere, and they must, in one way or another, relate to their authors, to their perceptions of the world, and their experiences of it. A writer's imagination is not impersonal, is it? And it is somehow connected to memory, isn't it? Homer's Odyssey begins with a call to the muse, Numo Zain, speak memory. The link between memory and imagination is old. Aristotle located memory and imagination in the same part of the soul, an idea echoed by Aquinas. Hobbes, a materialist, wrote, quote, imagination and memory are but one thing. 
which for diverse considerations has diverse names, end quote. Cavendish proposed a continuum of thought from reason to fancy, a nice borderless movement. For Spinoza, imagination was the lowest form of knowledge and contained memory inside it. Giambattista Vico, this is the early 18th century, regarded memory, imagination, and invention as parts of the same mental function and rooted them all in the body. Hegel understood consciousness and its ability to bring the past into the present as an act of the imagination. Although parsed in various ways by many thinkers, my point here is broad. Memory and imagination have repeatedly been connected or combined in philosophy, and this makes sense when you think of mental imagery. What are those pictures in our heads? I can call forth an image of you at dinner last night or a visual memory of the house where I grew up. But I also have a picture of a character in my most recent novel. I see Harriet Burden working on a sculpture in her studio in Red Hook, Brooklyn. The first two images are from life. The last one is from a work of fiction, but I do not think they are qualitatively different. There is a lot of research on false memory, memory distortion, misrecognition, and how one event often collapses into another to create a form of hybrid recollection. The same brain systems appear to be activated in both remembering and imagining. Recollecting oneself in the past and casting oneself as a character in the future belong to the same psychobiological processes. People who suffer memory loss from brain damage to the hippocampus are also poor at imagining detailed fictional scenarios. The scientists Daniel Schachter and Donna Rose Addis argue that our flawed, constructive memory <coughs> systems are actually adaptive because they are flexible rather than static and used to predict and anticipate what will happen to us um, through what has already happened to us. This is a quote from them. Thus, a memory system that simply stored rote records of what happened in the past would not be well suited to simulating future events, which will probably share some similarities with past events while differing in other respects. Gerald Edelman and Giulio Tononi, in their book, A Universe of Consciousness, propose that in higher organisms, every act of memory is to one degree or another also an imaginative act. Surely, imagining oneself in the future is the creation of a personal fiction, a narrative of what it might be like, which is, close, which is a close relative to what if I hope and I dread. The writing of fiction clearly partakes of this geography of the potential, the land of play, daydreams, fantasy, and reverie, of wishes and fears. The activity that the psychologist Endel Tulving called time travel, locating the self in the past and imagining it in the future, is a function of reflective self-consciousness the ability to represent and imagine oneself as another person. There is growing evidence that human beings are not alone in this. Dolphins, elephants, some primates, and birds, a lot of birds, can recognize themselves in the mirror and learn some forms of language, but our sophisticated linguistic capacities allow for a flowering of artistic and intellectual imaginative play that can't be found among other animals. Nevertheless, physiologically, we have much in common with our rat cousins who are alive, alert, and aware of their surroundings, who play and mate and negotiate their environments through learning and memory. It would be interesting to know what mental imagery rats have. I suspect that they do not call up pictures in their minds of a great meal last Sunday or fantasize about one a week from now. And I can say with some confidence that my dog Jack, now dead, who spent many hours in a state of canine torpor, never <laughs> once had an idea for a novel. <laughs> and yet, how does the link between memory and imagination help us understand why a book feels right or wrong? 
How can a writer possibly know where a story should take her? Robert Louis Stevenson, a writer who dreamed the doubles Jekyll and Hyde and attended closely to the nighttime visits of his brownies, the little people who danced about in the theater of his head for inspiration, asked the question I posed earlier. Why do some passages, some stories, some books feel wrong? This is a quote from Stevenson. The trouble with Olala, he wrote to a friend, is that it somehow sounds false, and I don't know why. I admire the style of it myself more than is perhaps good for me. It is so solidly written. And that brings back, almost with the voice of despair, my unanswerable, why is it false, end quote. I cannot answer for Stevenson. I can say that any number of well-written books feel false to me, that falseness has nothing to do with either good sentences or subject matter. Kafka's Gregor Samsa, Waking Up as an Insect, and The Terrible Loneliness of Mary Shelley's Monster are just as true as Tolstoy's evocation of Anna Karenina's ostracism or the grief of Wharton's Lily Bart in The House of Mirth for whom the links in her bracelet have come to seem, quote, like manacles chaining her to her fate, end quote. Truth, that is, the kind of truth Stevenson refers to is located elsewhere. I have written about this fictional truth in an essay that was originally published in the journal Neuropsychoanalysis under the title, Three Emotional Stories, Reflections on Memory, the Imagination, Narrative, and the Self. It is republished in my collection of essays, Living, Thinking, Looking, without the subtitle, Abstract, Keywords, and Peer Reviews. In the last line of the lopped off abstract, however, I write, quote, culling insights from Freud and research in neuroscience and phenomenology, I argue that a core bodily, affective, emotional, timeless self is the ground of the narrative is the ground of the narrative temporal self of autobiographical memory and of fiction, and that the secret to creativity lies not in the so-called higher cognitive processes, but in the dreamlike reconfigurations of emotional meanings that take place unconsciously." End quote. What does this mean? I cannot reproduce this tightly argued essay here, which was written for a specialized audience. But I can say that I am interested in what happens underground before an idea or picture or sentence surfaces. It is now a commonplace to say that most of what the brain does is unconscious or non-conscious for those who want to avoid sounding Freudian. There are many debates about the exact nature of the subliminal reality, but no one is claiming any longer that it does not exist. Although much of a story may be created unconsciously, the writer's recognition that a story is right is consciously felt. Feelings are by their very nature conscious and serve as guides for our behavior, even when we have no idea why we have the feelings we have. The neuroscientist Antonio Damasio's somatic marker theory is helpful in understanding how decision making works. To simplify, he argues that reasoning always has an emotional component. To isolate passion from intellect is a mistake. The decisions we make are the result of emotionally coded past experience, unconscious associations that are literally of our brains. Without feeling, we cannot decide anything. And despite certain arguments in analytical philosophy that argue otherwise, I maintain that emotions can never be unreal, even when they are triggered by fictions. I use the Russian formalist term fabula in three emotional stories to describe what a writer draws upon for a book. The difference between the fabula and the sujet can be described simply as the difference between what happens in a story and how it is told. The Cinderella fabula is always the same. Its sujet, on the other hand, has taken myriad forms. The fabula of a story feels to me 
as if it is already there in me, not yet known, but glimpsed as a kind of dreamlike memory, part of the subliminal self, a thing that must either be dredged to the surface or unleashed in a great rush. The sujet, on the other hand, is often up for grabs. How to tell it? Who should tell it? These are often fully conscious decisions. And yet it happens that parts of books or poems or entire works are written in trances. The underground pushes upward and appears fully formed to become Coleridge's Kublai Khan or Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra. In his classic work on creativity, 1952, it's actually really a wonderful book that everyone should own, that collects the accounts of many brilliant thinkers and artists, Brewster Gieselin writes in his preface, quote, production by a process of purely conscious calculation seems never to occur. Automatism is reported by nearly every worker who has much to say about his processes, and no process has been demonstrated to be wholly free of it, end quote. Countless writers, as well as mathematicians and physicists, have described sudden revelations that came to them in dreams, dream states, or in sudden rushes, rushes of inspiration. I have experienced periods of more or less automatic writing in my own work when a book appears to compose itself. It is exciting, and it only occurs in states of physical relaxation and mental openness to whatever comes along. It is a permissive, fearless state in which one gains access to stuff one didn't know was there. The psychoanalyst Ernst Chris referred to this as, quote, the release of passion under the protection of the aesthetic illusion, end quote, a phrase that nicely suggests explosive creativity without ego disintegration. The sudden release of a solution formula, poem, or part of a novel from subliminal regions of a person, however, is dependent on what is down there, to use a metaphor suited to the subterranean. And the bulk of that material, I am convinced, is not produced by an essential fixed self, finding your voice platitudes, nor does it come from some elusive quality of genius. It is the accumulation of years of reading and thinking and living and feeling. It is the result of autobiography in the loosest sense, not as literal facts, but as the creation of a story that appears from a writer's depths and feels emotionally true to her. The story of Mary Shelley's monster expressed her own deep reality. In her preface to the novel, she writes that the story poured out of her as in a waking dream. The lone, lonely, vengeful monster is a product of her own emotional complexity, but it is also, and this is essential, the product of her reading and love for John Milton. Milton's language the rhythms of his verse, the immensity of his Satan, were reconfigured and wholly reimagined by the 19-year-old Shelley, who wrote the story on a bet. Every good novel is written because it has to be written. The need to tell is compelling, and it is always directed at an other. Not a real other, but an imagined other person. In my case, the fantasy person is someone who gets all my jokes, references, puns, and has read every single book I have read. I've come to understand that despite my great longing for this stranger, she or he does not exist. Nevertheless, every work of fiction inhabits the realm of both I and you on what I call the axis of discourse or the in-between zone. Even journal and diary writing is written at the very least for another self, perhaps the one who returns to the entries years later and is surprised. The platitude that fiction writers are professional liars 
is offensive to me. There are novels that lie, but they will not last. The writer who gets her or his material from the ready-made cliches of contemporary culture is doomed to oblivion, no matter how popular she or he is at the moment. The truth of a work of fiction is not easily articulated, but it is one that comes alive between the reader and the text. Its resonance is sensual, rhythmic, intellectual, and emotional. The characters and stories may be fiction, but the feelings they evoke are real. So that's my little statement. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So what does this have to do with, you know, actually writing? I mean, that's, that's the question here. I think what it has to do with actual writing is that in my few forays into, into what I think of as lying, in my own case, by the way, in my own case, and sometimes uh, seeing it in others, is that lying is often connected to a kind of, a, a kind of fear, a fear of what the actual material is. And um, that overcoming fear may be one of the greater problems in writing fiction than, than anything else. Anybody can fix a sentence. <coughs> you know, we can have d disagreements about style, but style, fixing a sentence, what people obsess over craft, this is quite easily done. So, I open the floor to writing questions, writing stories, stuckness, difficulty, questions. I think the fear of whatever the material is in, in what I have, I've completely, you understand, completely redone the Russian formulas for my using their thing. What I'm saying is the fabula is unconscious in some way, and the, and the sujet is conscious. Something, you know, the, the story that wants to be told, if, if, if one resists that, then it can create tremendous writing problems. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm curious about the, the step between this this moment of creativity and then the, all the research, for example, that you conduct for for characters such as Harriet Burden. Um, I mean, I'm sure you, you looked at a lot of artist narratives and the research was all done. I did no research for Harriet. It's just in my head. All of that, the the the, the footnotes right. that my editor does are all in my library, and I just you know I obviously had to open the books to get the quotations right, but but I was not researching philosophy for Harriet Burton. No, the philosophy is a long accumulation, which is why I say the unconscious is not some kind of idiot phenomenon, right? The unconscious is also full of all the books that one has read over. How, in my case now, as I'm swiftly aging, many many years. So, um, and how about research into the art world and characters of the art world? And so, is there any? Uh, well, you know, I, I've been writing about art. I published a book on art, so that that's just was there. I actually did not do uh, any particular research for that novel. No, you know, particularly for that novel, it just, you know, kind of came out of me because I'm very interested in, I'm very interested in all the subjects that Harriet Burden is interested in, I have to say. <laughs> when you say the fabula is unconscious, or do you, when you finish a work, do you have a conscious awareness of like, aha, this is what I was getting at? Or do you think of it well, that way? Well, I think this is an interesting thing. Sometimes at the end of a book, or even years later, uh, I will understand some of the sources for a book that I didn't understand when I was writing it. That's entirely possible. You, you can become an, you can have an analytical position about your own texts. But I don't think that 
Um, listen, I, it's important to say that I'm talking about origins here. It's not that I don't think it's important that we're all critics of our own work. I mean, this is really important. And actually, Ernst Chris, who I quoted, talks about psychic levels in a very famous essay he wrote on, on aesthetic creativity. And he says, you know, there's this movement between psychic levels so that you've got this flow, you know, like the the stuff's coming out, you don't know where it's coming from, and then the artist has to stand back the way a painter does from a canvas and go, you know, do I like this? You know, becoming, in a way, the other, becoming the critic. So that keeps moving. It's just that what I have found in writing workshops is people seem to think that it's all about that. You, you, you see what I mean? I mean, this seems to be a, a, an entirely false position. But I mean, in your own work, your own, what, what, I mean, what do you feel? Does the craft get in the way of... It does if it's outside you. You see, I think that's the thing, of course. How do you deal with, can you have a true, you know, story with a fabula that's, <laughs> uh, and have have missed out or not known what to do with it, not have the craft. Oh yes, listen, I mean, I worked with psychiatric patients for four years as a volunteer <coughs> writing teacher in Payne Whitney, and I can tell you that, you know, there's a lot of creative stuff coming out of these people, but I wasn't gonna send it into a literary magazine. I mean, most of it. Some, actually there were a couple of quite brilliant people that I had that I, you know, told them to get yeah. your work into a, a literary magazine, but mostly, no. Um, so, of course, what I'm saying is that you need these levels. You need to be a rigorous critic of your own work, and you probably need to have a really good first reader that you completely trust and who's on the side of your work. But what I am saying here is that the, um, if you are only talking about this level of the sentence of the craft, mm -hmm. then what you get are a lot of extremely well-written lies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think work that's really beautiful, it's very highly conventional, it's highly conventionalized, and it's really empty. Because it's produced from some sort of external position. Oh, this is what a sentence is supposed to look like, or, or this is, you know, when I was a young writer, I used to write with, like, Wallace Stevens open. I just, like, hoped that Wallace Stevens would <laughs> just go in there, you know? <laughs> that, um, and, and I think that's a very typical position for young writers, especially when you're learning. You have to be an apprentice. It's very important to read. Um, but, you know, no one's ever going to write like Wallace Stevens except Wallace Stevens, you know. We're, I'm, can't become Emily Dickinson, as, you know, however much one is in a position of worship. It's interesting how we can sense it. I mean, you're saying yes. that the lie is created sort of from within the writer. They're, they're not, they're not, um, or however you want to call it, you know, expressing, allowing, they're, they're afraid of, you know, Yes. Might be, and so they'll focus on the craft, they'll sort of cram something in, put it together, and as a reader, what you feel is sort of that it's forced. Yes. Whether it's your own work, yes. or even more interestingly, someone else's work. Yes. So how, we can detect <coughs> that forced quality I think in we someone can. else's work. And I think it's because it, it has an emotional falseness. And I think that's what you're saying. When I am, it, yeah. yes, you can feel it. I remember yeah. reading a, actually a very accomplished novel with lots of good things in it. And I came to this part, it was about a, a woman in prison. And suddenly the whole thing just went bad. Mm -hmm. And I think there was something about that material. I can't climb into the head of the writer. There was something about that material that the writer was either afraid of, didn't want to explore, maybe needed to do a little research on, <laughs> you know, maybe maybe needed to listen to the voices of, of, of prisoners, for example. I mean, that's entirely possible. To enter it was just wrong. The whole thing just went to pieces. And in the few times I've taught, I've noticed that often a story will go to pieces when it's, you know, something like, 
a sexual scene, uh, some parental story. You know, I remember once, I mean, this thing about this woman, she abandoned the children in the story, and it was hugely dramatic, but somehow there was just something wrong with it. So what's wrong here? So of course she told me her own story about guilt, not actually she hadn't abandoned her children. You know, in the story it all got more, you know? <laughs> but there was something wrong. And so I do think that there are emotional roots in these fabulous that, you know, there's a reason someone wants to tell. And that, and that, and that, you know, and that you are able as a writer to know when you're telling the truth and when you're lying. And of course that has nothing to do with fiction or nonfiction. It has to do with some kind of emotional, you know, decision making, which so, is why I brought up Demasio. So yeah. Um, I really appreciate this distinction being made. I feel quite relieved between the craft <coughs> and between like this, we call it the stuff. That's yes, the stuff. Needs to get out. Yes. Because um, <laughs> I have this, I think I can write a nice sentence, but I don't think I'm very good at getting the stuff on the inside out. Um, and I just wondered, like, on a practical level, how can, how can we sort of stimulate this? Okay, I, I, this is actually interesting. I was thinking of doing it, but there are too many of you, but, but you can do it at home. I had a period very early when I was in my 20s, I actually put this in an essay, but uh, when I suddenly couldn't write. I was writing poems then. I couldn't write. I had p published, to my great happiness, a poem. The first thing I ever sent out to the, in the Paris Review was the most you know lofty thing I could think of. I sent it out, and they published it. After that, I had lots of rejections. So it, you know, it wasn't, but it was just one of those little wonderful things. Then suddenly, I couldn't write anything. Well, I could write things, but they were all horrible. It was like everything was a lie. You know, everything was false. I'd written what I thought was a good poem, sent it out, and suddenly I couldn't write anything anymore. And uh, David Shapiro, a, a poet, a, a good poet, still a poet, was a professor of mine at Columbia and became a friend. And he said, Siri, when I get stuck, I do automatic writing in the way that the Surrealists did. And I said, okay, great, I'll try it. I have my little manual typewriter. I sit, sat down, I, t I typed up 30 pages in a single night, totally auto, auto, autopilot writing. I spent the next three months editing, and I never wrote anything in lines again, except for some characters who write poems in my novels. But, and it, it unleashed something very interesting. Again, I'm not saying that you publish your automatic writing. I'm saying that automatic writing can be a way of tapping into that fabula. And it's, 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 it's quite an interesting experiment. But don't you have the experience that sentences actually uh, trigger ideas? Of course. Trigger other sentences. Of course. So my feeling that, is that the inspiration comes from the sentence I write. Yes, but one that that but that, that 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 would be that, but you but philosophically of course this would be an entirely false argument because you produced the sentence, right? So the sentence that you produced and registered perceived can of course in fact create another another sentence, but the sentence itself cannot generate the next sentence except I mean we're I'm just talking logically, right? There has to be a body acting on that sentence. Okay, yeah. I mean, your consciousness and unconsciousness has the to be part of ma ma manufacturing that sentence. To this sentence. Yes. So I have the feeling this creates an idea, I don't know where it's coming from. So that's, I didn't have it in my head before. Well, that's exactly the point, right? That um, the origin of certain sentences, especially those produced, I think, in a state of, re of relaxation rather than tension, can produce exactly that. It feels as if there is no creator, right? It feels as if the book is writing itself. Of course, it can't be.
because your fingers are moving. Uh, but 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 yes, exactly. And you know, there's the famous line, but you know, you don't know what you're, what what you mean to say until you say it. And I, I often find, for example, that if I write a bad sentence, it's all, often because I don't know what I want to say. Well, Heidegger says we don't have ideas. Ideas come to us. Well, but this is also part of the the, the, the contextual argument, which is of, which is why I said, what is down there, is not. Uh, <laughs> it is not you know some kind of primal slime. What's down there is also Heidegger. I mean, in your case, in my case, and probably other people's cases at the, at right here. So it's not that, that, yes, that I'm not talking, I'm not making a primeval slime argument. I'm making an argument that the unconscious is very sophisticated. You know, once you, if you have digested certain, and say, an idea of Heidegger's, once you've digested it, it becomes literally unconscious. It becomes part of the pool. It becomes an automatic idea. And of course, we couldn't have ideas if we didn't live. That's why I stress that at the end, every book is for another. It's an intersubjective reality. Even our unconscious selves are intersubjective realities created through others and a world of, of, of collectivity. So oh, on that note, I have like four things I want to Go respond ahead. To. Go for it. Your paper was so rich. Thank you. You're so welcome. So on that note, um, we talked about uh, we imagine a reader you know, that's read the same things we've read. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it occurs to me that, that that's, like, that's like your imagined lover. And yeah. so what if you have trouble really believing that there is that lover out there? So that's, can I, should I go through all Yeah, those? sure, sure, go for it. The other I part, like the lover thing. <laughs> Um, when we talk about the body and how it all comes from the body, then it occurs to me that, that our body needs to prepare itself also for the writing. And so the question is how to prepare the body fully. And I know there's relaxation and all that, but I'm, I'm curious of your thoughts on that. And then you started with you know how the truth and fiction is so indiscernible. <laughs> so it means that our whole lives are fiction. Actually, we don't. We don't know what we truly lived. That's, I, mean, that's <laughs> I agree. Is that, 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 that. That's what I'm saying. That's the that I, I am making the argument that in fact our autobiographical conscious memories are forms of fiction. Absolutely. Well, and it explains yeah. why different people in the same experience have different stories about these. Yeah, exactly. And then the, finally, <laughs> um, about our lived experience, our memories, and all that is what we bring in our unconscious subliminal life what we bring to the experience so that essentially what a young writer would bring is so different from what an older writer would bring. Yes, yes, so of course. All of those. Well, this is, okay, so the first thing about the lover is very nice. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, um, it's important to point out that, you know, no book is for everyone. You know, that there are, the book is made between the reader and, and, and the text. And um, that it's a form of collaboration because the reader is always supplying images, is in some way inventing the book or reinventing the book, if you will. So that lover, that other, um, is, is not everyone. I mean, there are some writers, you know, you think about the great, you know, genius writers who were also great, uh, you know, popular writers. Dickens is a wonderful example. Um, Marques, who just died, is another great example of, of that kind of broad appeal. But, you know, James Joyce didn't have it. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, Joyce is not for everyone. Um, so I think yeah, these are collaborative acts. So the, but the, there is a lover out there. <laughs> I mean, I think you that, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's important to believe that. Um, and okay, and th so we have the lover, and then the next thing was the body. How to prepare the body? Well, I just I really think that tension is the enemy of creativity, and that you know, people uh, when you know constipation is the result of tension, and it's also the result of probably paying too close attention to either 
the fact that one is producing a literary work mm -hmm. um, or producing something that is supposed to be, you know, live in the annals of, of literature forever, or comparing one's own work to the great writers of the past, um, I think this will absolutely get you nowhere. And that that creates constipation. And you know, one has to leap over that hurdle uh, before any kind of what one might call original or work can be done. So the body, and then the last thing. Well, the truth of fiction and discernible, and then about young writers versus. Yes, well, you know, it's interesting about the novel. The novel turns out to be a mature form. Mm -hmm. Poetry is not. Uh, plays are not. But the novel turns out, the greatest novels turn out to have been mostly produced by older people. I mean, speaking of Dickens, you know, I think Pickwick was published when he was 26. Uh, but Pickwick is not Dickens' greatest works. I mean, he was mature when he wrote, you know, Bleak House and, and, and uh, Our Mutual Friend and, and Little Dorrit. I mean, these are masterpieces. And he was, he died at 56, I believe, or 57. So anyway, but if you look, you see, and that's probably simply because of the accumulation of experience. And that long form is, you know, I'm not saying that there have been nice novels written by very young people, but it's pretty much a, you know, people still talk about a young novelist at 35, right? You know, a dancer is finished by then, you know. So, so it's, 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 you know, literature is, 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 is older. Yeah, do you think yeah. it's the length of a novel that, you know, makes it more of like a mature form or sort of a form that's sort of dominated by uh, older or more mature people? versus like the brevity of a poem or? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I remember feeling that I started a novel when I was about 19 or 20 and I thought I had a fabulous beginning. I just did, had no idea what to do with it. Um, and, and so I wrote poems and very, very short stories um, because I could have a kind of control over them. So yeah, I think that's, that's true. I mean, a novel is an organism and experience of both living but also of writing them helps helps you along. And I'm, I'm also curious, because um, you made the distinction between, you class plays with um, poems, and you know, a play can be a beast, it can be quite long and involved. Yes, um, but somehow there have been more younger great playwrights than, um, than, uh, than novelists. You're right, I'm just wondering why that is. Dialogue. I think it's dialogue. Um, I mean, that that would be my guess. Dialogue kind of comes, you know. We we've, we've got it in us, you know. We've got these voices in us, multiple voices, and you know, once you um, find these characters, they, they they can talk to to one another. So it may, may that may be it. Um, I have a, another question about the fabula yes. and one's own perception of it. And, yes. then, and then the reader who may or may not be that lover, in fact, the one who isn't, yeah. who <laughs> reads your novel, <laughs> loves it, yes. and then when you overhear her talking about it, you're like, Oh, well, that, this is yeah. the experience of reviews. Right, right. This is exactly it. You know, people saying, you know, this is just fabulous. And they seem to not have understood what you said. <laughs> and you go, well, thank you very much. But um, I think this is just part of the drama of reading. You know, people are going to find things in your work, whether they love it or hate it, that aren't there. I mean, that's just, that's going to happen. Either because they're bringing a, a certain lack of experience in terms of your work to to, to that reading. So that's why I mentioned a good reader, someone you trust. Because then you can say, if that person points out some soggy place, you, trust. you can have much greater faith. And usually the soggy place in my experience, and it, I, I do this with my husband, he does it for me, is that you already know. Mm -hmm. But to have someone confirm 
the SOG <laughs> is, is very helpful and can save you time <coughs> because the doubt that's hanging around the passage has been confirmed. But no, if you listen to everybody, then you'll go crazy. Yeah. But speaking, for example, of your uh, last book, there is, and speaking of the relationship of the reader to your book, there is the fact that it's told by different people who are uh, who have vastly different uh, thoughts about yes. Harriet Burden. Yes. Um, this is a way. I mean, it's very. It's. it's I don't know if you want to call it postmodernist or whatever, but it's a very different reader from the one that is generated by, let's say, Dickens or, um, or Balzac. Yes. Well, the idea. I mean, I did. I was perfectly conscious of the thought that in that particular book, uh, is a a book about the drama of perception, and that by reading the the very act of reading the book forces the reader to engage in a refracted perception. You know, so that uh, that the act of reading is is destabilizing. And, and I think <coughs> that it's uh, quite interesting that Francine Froses who just wrote... Uh, yes, I read the review. I haven't read the book. Well, but. it's... I mean, I'm not going to say anything about it, except for the fact that she has exact... I mean, her theme is totally different. Right. Although, it, 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 you know, it's a woman character. Right. Um, but it's also told from different voices. Uh -huh. which is well, this is not new, no, right? I mean, new. Faulkner, I mean, the great, you think about, there are many, there are many, many, many uh, 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 things like this, and I, um, so, but it was my first time, right. actually, right. and um, and I, I like to call it my multiple personality disorder right. book, because it, it really made me feel as if I had alters coming out, and, and, <laughs> Speaking of weird writing experiences, so if I shifted, you know, from one day I would finish one person and go to someone I had already done, I would spend a little time recovering the voice, which I suspect is like an actor, right? And, and so there are these similarities between acting, or method acting maybe, and, and, and making characters. Huh. So, um craft, it seems, can be taught. Right? I think so. Okay. But then the authenticity, the, you know, the, the, the fear, the overcoming of the fear, um, it could be encouraged, led to, sort of taught. Um, what do you do when you are recognizing a place of SOG, as you said, recognizing that, okay, this isn't quite working, I haven't gone deep enough? What do you tell yourself, and how do you help yourself go through it? Yeah, I, I think also this is a matter of patience, so that now I have become patient with myself. I, I never panic. You know, I think, okay, this is bad. Actually, the middle of the, this most recent book, I just suddenly thought, it's, it's gone off. You know, I'm going off. It's kind of boring. And so I thought, okay, fine, let's go back to the place where it starts to get boring. <laughs> and I mean that as a reader, because I would read everything I'd written, and if I was engaged, really as a kind of other, you know, like just in that critical way, I would find the, let's say, the, the, the spot where the books seemed to go off. And then just got rid of all of that and started again from that place. That's one thing. Um, as far as, you know, sort of uncovering the essential fabula, you know, the story that you want to say, I was going to make a, a, a joke. I was going to say I talked to my analyst, but, um, <laughs> but it's, it's only half a joke um, in the sense that there is, a, there is a psychoanalytic aspect to all this, which is that, you know, repression, uh, uh, you know, a f a f you know, neurotic constipation is an enemy of 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 creative work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, you, you, yes. So, yeah, um, you talked about the um, separation between the body and mind, and especially in art criticism, there's the debate going on if you can um, separate between the author and his, and his work. Yes. So there are loads of authors that have questionable opinions, politically or mm -hmm. whatever way. So what would you say? Well, you know, this Roland Barthes, re remember, well, you would. We you were quite too young, but Roland Barthes had this great thing: the author is, you know, the death of the author. This became a, a very hyped position. Of course, Barthes was also talking about the biography as the author, and I mean male, you know, French, white guy, you know, in in, in big letters, and. So this was also part of the late 60s desire to destroy that kind of edifice of the author, uh, which I'm all for. The idea, however, that a text is completely divorced from the author is, let's face it, just ridiculous. It's, it's garbage. Um, the, the idea that you can reduce a text to the author, however, that is a falsehood. And it's also a falsehood for some of the reasons I mentioned in this little talk, which is that the author doesn't know what the heck she's doing half the time. And as I have often said to myself, the book knows more than I do. And that is a strange thing. And that is what philosophers have been trying to figure out for years. How the hell do we produce something novel? Literally, I mean, this is where the name comes from, but how does it happen? It's got to happen through the body and through our senses and through everything. But human beings are able to create novel things, novel things that have never been created before. And that's a very, that's a profound question. As you were just um, talking about text work, do you think there's a difference to other forms of art, like music or painting, like the way the author Inscribes himself. Um, I, I, I mean, I mentioned physicists and, and mathematicians at the end of this little talk because I think it's important to to understand that creativity is not only about you know the the fine arts. Uh, music, you know, Schopenhauer said that music was the highest art and the greatest representation of what he called the will um, because it for him it really was a representation of human feeling, you know, gefühl, as opposed to wissen, you know, which was the, the intellect. Um, so the arts function in different ways, but the roots, I think it's all the same. And I think, you know, there are a lot of scientists I know, the really good ones, um, who work in ways very similar to poets. Uh, Einstein said, I love this quote, that's in that Gislam book that I quoted, but Einstein said, he was asked by Jacques Hadamard, the mathematician, how do you work? And he said, none of my work really takes place in signs, either linguistic or mathematical. My work is visual, muscular, and emotional. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I would agree with that. What he was, and then he said later. Then he translates it. <laughs> but um, but we know from stories about Einstein that he was very visually oriented, as are many mathematicians. Um, so this kind of what you what scientists would call a lower level, and maybe that's an awful kind of term. But that beginning level of creativity is, I think, is not happening in signs or in you know any kind of denotation. Yeah. Um, so we were talking a little bit about fear um, of failure, and mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask about fear of delving into the subconscious and what you'll find there. Because, oh yeah. <laughs> right. Because so like creepy. with something like psychoanalysis, <laughs> it's contained in a way, mm -hmm. you know, it's and you safer. have yeah, it's safer. You have the room, you have the time limit, you have the analyst who's your guide, and when you're writing, <laughs> it's so solitary. So. Yeah, I was wondering what your thoughts are and well, how to make it a little bit. As I said, I mean, you know, fearful. it's it's not my intention to, to turn right into a kind of, you know, psychoanalytic activity, but I have found in my workshop experiences that actually the biggest problems with writing are not about 
you know, a crummy sentence. They're about these very deep places in the writers that they're either afraid of or want to, you know, cover over unpleasantness, you know? <laughs> I, I deeply understand this. I think that, so I think, you know, that courage is actually something that's part of the act of making fiction. That it, it, it takes a kind of courage to face emotional truths. Um, and, you know, if you need therapy to do that, that's good too. Mm -hmm. but, but, but no, I, I, I mean, I'm, I, and I know what you mean, that there's something terrifying about finding the right story, uncovering the right story, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit um, about the situation where um, the in, where the inadequacy of language comes into play? Mm. Where um, mm. it's you know you you've had that moment where you reached down there, but <laughs> it language hasn't, isn't it, adequate to yes. sort of bring it. Well, language is always inadequate. I mean, this is such a fascinating thing, isn't it? You know, a book is just words. Nothing but words, it's just words, those little, you know, black symbols on the page. I mean, I, I always find this amazing. And somehow, they can be animated by the reader. But you're absolutely right that sometimes you've had a big feeling. It's like a, a, a marvelous, you know, experience. You've tried to put it onto the page, and then when your critical self goes back and looks at the page. It's a little bit like, you know, having a dream. You have a revelation in a dream and you're given like a word. <laughs> you know, when you wake up in the night and you write it down and you look it up in the, in the morning, it's just garbage. I mean, you say, what? what? So that's it. Then you have to, I think, go again. You know, because the critic self is able to see that this is just no good. Um, and and so, you know, they're not commensurate. In other words, the text, the, you know, the, the, the argument here is that feeling is going to tell you about truth and falseness. Huh? And that has something to do with judging not the form necessarily of your sentences. It's, it's involved in that. But in, you know, judging whether the words have at least to the best, you know, of your ability, expressed whatever that thing is. And sometimes that can mean, I think, fragments. You know, if you think about the rhythmic aspects of prose are so important because the reader is participating in the rhythm. I mean, this is something Suzanne Langer, wonderful writer who isn't talked about much anymore, but um, she talks about how she talks about uh, non-discursive forms, non-discursive works of art where um, you can't translate it into something else. So Emily Dickinson, great example. You know, if you try to take a Dickinson poem and then write beside it, you know, what Dickinson really means, you, do not, you, have, <laughs> you have nothing, right? So that would be a non-discursive way of writing. You simply cannot summarize Emily Dickinson's poems and say what, what they really meant. Whereas like a graph, you know, in so certain science things, you can make a verbal text of it and it will mean exactly the same thing. That would be a discursive form. It has a, it's, it's a limited. Yeah. Uh, previously, you, you said that, for example, Harriet Burden shared a lot of the in interests that you had when she talked about yes. perception. Mm -hmm. um, the character, I can't remember her name, but the character of The Summer Without Men was also interested in some of these. Mia. Uh, right. She was also interested in philosophy. And phenomenology, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Could you talk about how much of um, yourself do you allow, you know, those characters? Well, the thing is, it's very hard to invent interests. I mean, I mean, I can, actually, I mean, one can. I have a character who's sort of, you know, high on the spectrum in that book, too, Ethan. Um, and, 
and he, for example, loved a writer that I do not love, Tolkien. Never gave a crap about Tolkien. But, but Ethan, I could see, he would love him. It would be the perfect, you know, childhood reading. It would be part of his imagination, which is how he actually comes to this very weird saga uh, scholar <laughs> that was through Tolkien because I realized, I mean, anyway. But, yeah, so that's going out of the range of my interest, but it's kind of hard to invent, yeah, interests. There, there is a limit. How about, you know, traits of personalities. Oh, well, that can be very different. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm sure that one finds, I mean, there's some very unpleasant characters in that book, and I wrote them in the first person, and um, I suppose there, there's a kind of pleasure in that, too. You're probably drawing on your own sadism, you know, which can be fun, um, but uh, yeah, there are, pro there are limits. I mean, there is a, there's a geography, and I have a feeling there are limits to the internal geography. You know, the fabula is something that you muck around in and explore, but there are probably limits to it, which is why, even though theoretically it's possible to write about anything, people don't. You know. Are there moments where, for example, in Harriet Burden's case, you see something in the character that reminds you of that makes you realize something about yourself that is scary? Well, I think in all the characters. Yeah, I think that's the act of writing a novel, is that you actually can discover aspects of yourself that were that you were completely unaware of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, want, I want to ask, uh, what, what do you think, what do you feel about the role of, like, of like obsessions for like a writer? Because I feel like that, <laughs> yeah. um, like, so my favorite writer is, like, the the best work that they've done is something that they've been obsessed with. Mm -hmm. Yes. And like, you know, like, uh, like Mary Shelley, like she, you know, she had this dream about this, this, this creature, and she yeah. was obsessed with that notion because of that. She wrote Frankenstein. I mean, yeah. yeah. For my opinion, it's probably it's so modern today because it really has these undertones, you know, about child abuse, about neglect, about effect and defect, about everything. And and um and birth and birth, most birth particularly and death, yes. Um, and, and I write poetry and I feel like some of the some of the best poems I feel like I've written is because I'm obsessed with something like I I've been obsessed with like doppelgangers and natural selection calligraphy paintings by Salvador Dali I'll so write about that it's like you have that. a good range yeah <laughs> I, um, and like I'll write poems on these and I'm like, like these are pretty good but the other things I'm unconscious about are like I'm not really sure about it so like, I'm, just, I'm just wondering no, about... No, but, but I think, again, you're, I, I think you're absolutely right. And also, interestingly, this addresses this, some of these other questions, is that obsessions return. There's not really much one can do about it. I, I mean, and I think, uh, for example, I, I've, I've always found that um, cross-dressing will probably eternally return in my work. I mean, I just seem not to be able to stop myself. Um, uh, s certain, you know, like objects, like unheimlich things keep coming up in my work. Um, dolls. I, I, you know, there's certain obsessive interests that I can't get over. Yeah. And I'm not aware that they're coming up again in a text, but there they are. And, you know, if I like them, I, I keep them. You know, so taking care of your obsessions, you know, we love them. That's, that's, so I, I think that's fine. I do think that that kind of obsessive energy has, um, I mean, you are attributing a level of consciousness to obsessive energy that I don't think is, is true. In other words, you're aware that you're obsessed with calligraphy, but maybe the roots of that obsessive interest are totally unknown to you, yeah. right? Yeah. So that the energy that is creating these probably perspicacious, energetic, and interesting works. You could identify it as the obsession, but the roots of that obsession are, are in, in fact, unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that, that I felt, that I've been feeling like writing about these certain obsessions I've had. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just follow your nose. I mean, I think that's great. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi. <laughs> I feel like I might have asked you this before, but it's a more pragmatic question. You talked about the terror 
how terrifying it is to identify the stories uh, or to finding the stories, but how do you identify the stories that are worth well, you know, this is not, I mean, I think, again, these are really profound questions because after I finished this novel that, you know, I've been finished with it for a year, and I've been ri steadily writing papers for symposiums and conferences that I, that is sort of now part of my life and that I like, but I had an idea for a novel. I started writing it, and I realized it was wrong. And I realized that I was writing the anti-Harry. You know, you want, that I was writing in reaction to the last book. And that's not, that's not a good thing. You know, kind of like to, to purify myself <laughs> of the other book. And you know, I think I'm, I'm finding something else, but it's taking me a while to find it. And um, I don't want to sit down in a, just in a complete, you know, at a loss. I have to have some trajectory where I think I'm going before I start. But yeah, no, I don't think these things just pop up out of nowhere. And they have to be nursed along, and you can make absolutely wrong starts. You know, my husband started writing a book that he abandoned, and he abandoned it because it's true. I mean, I listened to it. It just kept going sideways. It didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> anywhere, you know, and I think he wasn't over the book that he had written before. So you have to, you know, you have to, sometimes you have to recover from books. Yeah. Do you know where it's heading when you start? Or do you I have some it? kind of smell, some trajectory, some image, some thought, and it doesn't have to work out, but you just, you, you need to be able to move forward and not sideways or or just be reacting to something you did before and trying to do the anti-book of that. This is a, a bad policy. And again, the sentences were lovely. <laughs> just lovely. I mean, you know, I can look at those pages, I go, really? Great, you know. It's just the whole thing is wrong. That It's wrong, you know, and it, and it will never see the light of day. But that it's. I think these are the big questions, as I said, that are often never asked. You know, where do you get your ideas? Well, it's hard to, to tell, but it's not a stupid question. I'd like to know yeah. a little bit more about the nature of this fear. Is it also that it could be uh, being afraid of being exposed? So, in other words, is it shame? <clears throat> I think shame can be a big one. I have a, a, a actually a very gifted uh, Norwegian cousin, a, a writer, and he keeps producing work. He's that's all. I mean, he when he needs, he will work a little bit. He'll, he'll get some money, and then he lives on the money, and he writes, you know, six hours a day. Never publishes. He's shown unfinished things. Of course, he never finishes it either, right? Because, because then, once you finish it. You have to put it out there, you know, naked, for other people to uh, to to murder, and and that's I think yeah I think that can be a huge issue in neurotic writing problems. On the other hand, shame can be a reason to write beautiful sentences, to try to hide something. So yeah. it, you can making an aesthetic. The, the, you know, can you think of a text where shame is hidden that is a beautiful text? I think Kafka is a shameful writer. I think he's a very shameful writer, but I think the force of Kafka is that you actually feel the shame. Yeah, I think you. I think the experience of reading Kafka is that is that you participate in in the shame at times in brutality, in humor, but I don't think that, I mean, it could be that, that for Kafka, the act of writing had a comp, you know, was, was a form of compensation, but I think the power of Kafka is, is that it's, in, in Kafka, everything is irreducible. It's both, that's what yeah. I was to say. Yeah, yeah, but, but, I mean, my relationship to Kafka is one where I, I am participating in the, in the shame. Mm 
And I think shame may be one of the hardest things to write about that there is. And it is about exposure and the other. Yeah. Yeah. When people do read what you've written, when you've published it, do you ever get reactions that you don't like? Oh, of course. They're not, they're not liking it, but they're saying, oh, you're writing about that person, or you're writing about me, or... Oh, you mean you mean you mean uh, 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 a sort of you mean taking from stealing from life things? Um, yeah, people people bizarrely and incorrectly saying that it's that taking it's, it literally. Oh well, I you know I have this thing that that it doesn't matter if I write as twenty characters or I write as a man or I write as a woman. People are always thinking that it's it's my life. I mean, I, I find this extraordinary. <laughs> and um, and and you know so everything gets reduced to the autobiography somehow I, I I really can't tell you how this is done, but there's always this sly suspicion that I can't that I haven't invented anything. Now I don't know, but I my sense is that this happens more to women than to men, because the idea is to re with women it's it's all personal. You know we're not capable of the great, you know, uh, imaginative powers of, of, of the male writer, so everything has to be about my own personal feelings. Um, you know, I think the work should speak for itself. Yes, it's annoying, but uh, that's, uh, being annoyed is part of being a published writer. <laughs> but what if you have people who are sure that they are the character? Or they are in. I think that's what I thought you were. Well, talking that can about. be. That can be. You know, a, 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 a fantasy for some people. Of course, it has to do with whether the person really is, or not. I mean, we do, we do steal things from life. I have stolen things from life, and I remember I stole someone for my first novel, and. Um, was at the book had been published, and it was a few, maybe a, a year after or something. And I met the person <laughs> in a cafe, and you know we said hi. We had been intimate. This is, this. and I I didn't say it. I, I wrote about this in an essay. The name of the character oh, uh, no. came oh, before the name, name of the person of the actual person. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, you know, Nabokov talks about this, how actually if you take things from your life and use them, that use can supplant the actual thing in memory. It actually changes. So this is probably part of what, you know, what they call the reconsolidation of memories, is that you're actually shifting the ground of it. Um, so we do, of course, people steal things from their lives. I mean, and I would never say that I haven't stolen from life. Of course I have. But, but I've also made up a, tons of things that people think I must have done. Uh, the thing about, I had an experience about relating to shame. I wrote a play in college and I used a myth Yes, and I used all the myth of uh, Semele and and uh, yes, Zeus. Uh huh. And the play was performed. It was just a, you know for yeah college, and I was horrified because it was as though I had stood up on the stage and stripped. I mean, there were things in it that I didn't realize. I don't know if anyone else picked up on them, but they were too close to a reality that I wasn't acknowledging. Yes, well that's Does interesting. It, Actually seeing a performance like that, yeah. especially with actors embodying um, characters. There was a play made of one of my novels in Argentina and you know I was invited and I did some other things in Buenos Aires and I went to see this play. It was of my first novel. And I, I'm looking at this play and I'm going, oh my god, this whole thing is about these men pushing these this women around, you know, 
And there's certainly a way to read that first novel as exactly about that. But it had never occurred yeah. to me. And I think that's what happened to you. I was going to say that myth, of course, <laughs> is that's myth perfect. for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's deep material inside myths that, and you probably were attracted for, for, yeah. for particular reasons. But it can be very, um, it can be sort of dangerous because it became a thing where I couldn't write something unless I put it in the form of a myth where I distanced distance my, it from well, listen, my own. Well, listen, I think we, I, I think this is a great subject. There, distance is needed. I mean, this is a very interesting question. You can't just, this is, I am not talking about, you know, glopping your confessions on the page. The transformations of fiction, the distancing that happens in fiction, is, I think, where the beauty comes. You know, where, that's when the book knows more than you do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a solo performer, so, I mean, I, I write plays that star me and are just me. Yes. Um, what a lot of people assume have to be autobiographical. Right. Um, it's not always. Um, no. But the best solo shows that I've seen or have been a part of, it's been interesting because it seems like the person has used a character or like a, an imagined situation that sheds like a new truth on themselves. But they yes. have to have like the distance because like the stereotypical like, terrible solo show that no one wants to see is like the one where someone like sits on a stool and like talks about their dad <laughs> about like any kind of yeah panel. yeah well this is you know and I, it's like I mean you know we we live in a culture that's very fond of this right the confessional <laughs> mode especially fond of what I call survival stories right so that it's not enough just to to you know to vomit out you know all the garbage of your own private history then what's really good you have to add the survival part to make it like Oprah, so that not only did you, you know, were you beaten and a drug addict and, and were lying in the street, then you rise. You rise, you triumph. It's like Sinbad, you know, but not, not as good. And then, you know, it's like you pop back to life and, and you're better. You know, that's, you're better than before. Um, so, no, yes, we're not talking about that. We're, and it's interesting. So, even. Someone like uh, Spalding Gray, right? Yeah. Who, who would just, you know, he'd sit up there and kind of talk about his, you know, all kinds of things, his mother's suicide. And, just, you know, and it was riveting. But there was also something cold in it. It was as if he was an observer. You know, if you think about the greatness of Proust, right? The, the Marcel writing the other Marcel. It's not, you know, I, I wrote an essay, I got so irritated because I think it was James Atlas who published something that's when the, conf you know, when the memoir mode was in its absolute peak, saying that if Proust were writing now, he'd write a memoir. <laughs> this really made me angry. Um, and, and I think, yeah, you know, so stupid, right? Um, so that those transformations of fiction, um, you know, perhaps we can think of it in some way at, like the condensations and transformations of dreams are very potent. Which is not to say that there's not an emotional core, but it's just, it's not spilling, you know, your I was going to say dirty diapers, you know? I mean, it's like, it, it, th there's something, yeah, you know, because that makes you squeamish. That makes the reader unhappy and uncomfortable. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not, that's not what art is. Oh, my daughter said a beautiful thing. I can't remember what book we had finished, but it was a really sad book, and it was a, you know, a grown-up book. She looked at me and she said, you know, Mom, Great books can be really, really sad, but they're never depressing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, uh, Isn't that a beautiful comment? She yeah. was about 11. I thought, good for you, honey. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> they're not depressing. And this is what, you know, Aristotle talks about only once in the poetics. The word catharsis, he only uses it once. And that is this kind of strange purge 
but that is pleasurable. That's a kind of wower, you know. In life, it's not pleasurable. But in art, it is when it's well done. You feel more alive, right? And, and that's what he says, you know, in tragedy, the comedy part of the poetics is lost, but we know that he felt in tragedy that you feel more alive. You know, the pity and the grief that you're feeling is not something that makes you want to go home and, you know, just go under the bed and never leave. It's not depressing. It's enlivening. He was writing Sorry. about theater, and I think it was yes. fully participatory, and people knew the text too. So it yes. was really much more meaningful than you know when we read a story, you know, and kind of go and watch the news and then do something else. We're talking about full participation. Yes, but don't you think, say, it's a sad story like *Crime and Punishment*? It's a really sad story. It's a terrible story. Mm -hmm. But when Raskolnikov, you know, kisses the, in, kneels in the marketplace at the end, you don't <coughs> feel depressed. I mean, this horrible thing has happened, but what Dostoevsky leaves you with is a feeling of transcendence. And, um, and that, so that's a similar novel experience to what Greek theater was doing in tragedy, uh, a more modern example. But if you end up feeling depressed, that, does that mean that the person who's created it has failed? Failed in a way. Um, I would say yes, but of course there are people who are probably much more depressive than others. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have to give the reader some responsibility too. Yeah, right? Maybe. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you work toward a plot? Yeah, that's the thing. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I think when I was talking about an arc earlier, I, um, I, I, I meant that that, 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 that you know that you're going somewhere ahead. Mm -hmm. So that there's, certain, there's a certain motion of a text. For example, in the, this last book that I published, I had this idea of three masks. Speaking of Greek theater, Greek theater was actually hiding in my mind, you know, human masks, and that there was this fairy tale structure of the plot, which then became immensely more complicated by all the voices and all these other things that became part of the book, too. Um, but I think that that's generated, that's fabulous stuff, you know, that's generated unconsciously. Um, it has happened that I, I thought that I wanted something, and then the characters refused to do it. Like, uh, I had an, I wrote a novel called The Sorrows of an American, and I really wanted these people to get together and get married, and it was my going to be my like happy ending book, <laughs> and it, they just wouldn't do it. <laughs> no, no way. Really they, really was, they just <laughs> wouldn't do it, and and it was interesting. So there, there, you know, what what is that? Well, it's that characters do seem to gain some autonomy during the course of a book, and then you really can't force them to do what they don't want to do. At the end of the day, it's almost like a translation. And, you know, you have some leeway, but. Well, that's an interesting way to think about it. I mean, that in, in some way, uh, language itself is a form of translation um, of human experience. And, you know, it's abstract. It's wholly abstract language. but. Um, it's, a, it's very, very interesting to think about what reading actually is and how it relates to the rhythms of the body, how the rhythms of a sentence, for example, can echo the urgency of a scene. You know, I've been working on a paper for a symposium in Lake Como called As If. It's about neuroscience simulation and all kinds of things, but one of the things I use this little in Wuthering Heights, Emily Bronte begins a section. Do you remember this book in, in the beginning, the narrator, there's several narrators, but there's, he's locked in this bizarre kind of bedroom, which is like a book and like a coffin, where uh, Catherine used to be, and her ghost comes to the, to the window. Mm -hmm. Let and he in. takes, remember, he takes the wrist of the phantom and scrapes it, and anyway, 
Bronte begins this passage with these words, terror made me cruel. So, you know, I'm doing this thing about discursive, can't, you can't translate that because it's, it's part of the rhythm of what then becomes after. Terror made me cruel. You've got the two R's. You've got this rhythm that said, terror made me cruel. Then suddenly, you, you know, he's like doing, and then the blood is flooding the bed sheets. I mean, it's hugely dramatic, beautifully written. And you can actually do an analysis of the rhythms that she's establish, establishing to make the scene go. You know, and if you start to elongate the sentences at all, it's, it's all screwed. So, so you see how, you know, words are, you know, it's not onomatopoeia, right? I mean, they're still, to they're abstractions. But um, Merleau-Ponty talks about the gestural in language, and he also is referring to the emotional force carried by, say, poetry, for example. Um, it's all really interesting. Do you still write poetry? I've written poetry for my characters, characters who write poetry. I've written, I wrote a, a, a sonnet for Oliver Sacks' 80th birthday. Mm -hmm. um, I do things like that, you know, formal verse, occasional verse, but, but it's prose for myself, yeah. Because, um, for instance, I have a writer's group and they want me to write more description, more dialogue, and I do, and, and I do it well, but I don't like it. Don't, you shouldn't do that for, for them. You shouldn't do that. See, this, this is what I'm talking about. I am talking about the rules. Mm -hmm. And I am saying to all of you, there are no rules. There are no rules in art. There is nothing that is a novel. And we should all know this, every human being who has read Don Quixote. How old is that novel? Everything's in there. You know, the whole history of the goddamn novel is in Don Quixote, and he's just having fun with everything. It's ridiculous, this stuff, that you have to have dialogue, you have to have description of sofas. Who gives a shit unless the sofa is really meaningful in some important way? The sofa is important. I never described things. She's talking to sofa. I know what they look like, you know, because I have a very visual imagination. But, um, you know, uh, John Coetzee is a friend of mine, and he said that when he writes, if he needs a sofa, it pops up. It's not even there before. It's like if a character needs to sit down on it, 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 it you know, the sofa pops up. He, you know, he said basically, you know, his, his, it's like a white cube. You know, these are great books. They're written in white cubes. I mean, who cares? You know, Jane Austen doesn't describe a goddamn thing. No, but you see, this makes me angry. And it makes me angry because that is this idea that is taught in writing schools. I mean, people would say to me, but... But you, you can't do that. And I say, why not? I say, so who told you that? Well, you know, you're supposed to like tell, not show, or what? No, show, not tell. Yeah. Is it going, what are fairy tales? They're all telling. We don't like fairy tales. We're not allowed to tell. What could, this is crap. And it's being propagated you know, by people who are propagating this garbage. And it's, it's nonsense. The history of literature is not this, huh? No. No, you don't want to write descriptions of sofas. You just <laughs> leave those things out. People who want to do that, that's so, I mean, I'm all for it. Dickens wrote some beautiful descriptions of furniture. Usually they're coming alive, you know. But uh, uh, no, no, no. See, this is what pains me. Exactly that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. People come to me with these little rules. Right. Where did you get that? What kind of rule? There's no rule. You could do whatever the hell you want. You just have to, you have to believe it. it. You know, you have to, um, you know, you can play. It's play too. This is play. You know, if you really, if you're depressed writing, it's not good. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the same thing. 
if you're getting pleasure, even if you're weeping, you know, over your death of your character, or whatever, this is fine. But if you're sitting there going, oh, I'm really so bored, and you know, this is so hard, and and you know, what does the sofa really look like? Then it's 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 bad. And then the reader feels it. Mm -hmm. Is what? Who is that talking about? You can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's a, a legitimate place for a writing workshop? <laughs> I'm doing it, sort of. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I do, but I but I also think that that um, you know that the yes, because I I think for example, it it is possible. You know, like I could hang up a sentence on the on a big blackboard here, and we could all look at it. We could all talk about it. And probably most of us in this room would be would agree, say, about an unnecessary word and, and one adjective too many, uh, you know, tighten up the sentence, uh, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff you could talk about in a absolutely, I think, fairly convincing way, which is why people are always teaching craft. But the other stuff about, you know, a story should go like this, uh, you know, you should show, not tell. That's I stupid. I don't mean things on that level, but on the level that you're talking about. Well, I think we can learn from, we could certainly learn from reading, and I think we can probably learn from talking to our fellow, you know, scriveners. Uh -huh. um, at the same time, you know, the emotional truth for one person is not going to be the emotional truth for another. No, you know, which is why you don't it. want sofas in your fiction. Well, <laughs> yeah. And don't let people, you know, impose them. Yeah. Well, it's or why like, dialogue? Who cares? Reading. So you could have a book that's all dialogue, or have a book where there's not no one ever says a word, and it's all told. You know. <coughs> Are you te teaching a workshop now? No. Do you? Not very often. Um, I think partly because. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, I think, as I said, I think people can talk about things, but it, you know, with me, it often gets down to this level. You know, I look at a paragraph. I mean, I actually did something at the Y before I gave a reading there last month. You know, just a few people, and there was this actually kind of. It was. It's interesting. It's like about fabula and sujet. It was the most clotted writing I had ever seen. But the story was pretty damn good. You know, you could kind of see through. There was a good story under there. And I said to this writer, I think you're really anxious about your sentences. You know, and to actually, you know, the tears started to come. She'd written this thing over and over and over again. And you could see that she just couldn't trust herself at all. She had a good story. She just was, it was like, you know, the neuroses were just hanging out in these sentences like crazy. Perfection. But the, it wasn't perfection, no, it was I the know. opposite. When people looking for perfection, everything that that's what That's what happens, yeah. yeah. The sentence get worse and worse, I think, yeah. yeah. I was just wondering, um, um, is Harriet Burden too smart and well-read and articulate to be an artist? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, artist, no. There are some very, you know, uh, if you ever, if you sit down and read uh, Theo uh, Van Gogh's uh, uh, those letters that the two brothers shared. I mean, they're very, very highly literate and intelligent letters. There were some. Th th there have been some highly um, knowledgeable artists, visual artists. Um, there, there have also been people who don't know what they're doing and do it very, very, very well. So again, yeah. there, is, there is no rule. There's, there's no, no rule. Balance of there's no like, rule. Is there a rule here? Um, if, when you get to that spot that's scary because of the shame or the emotion attached to it, there, you can do a number of things, but you could ignore it and yes. sort of go around it and just leave that out, or you could go there. Go there. And do you think it's all, you know, that the best writing comes from going there? Well, as I said, this is a thing that, that probably the best writing may come from going there with a form of courage, which 
again, it can't be, there has to be some distance. Um, oh, who was it? Um, the great, a great, great theater director whose name will come back to me. But um, no, it is, um, he did, you know, the great Marat Saad and. Oh, Brook, Peter Brook. Peter Brook. He said, um, what I'm looking for in theater is the grandeur of myth and the closeness of the everyday. Without the grandeur, you can't be amazed. And without the closeness, you can't be moved. I think this is really <laughs> genius, you know. Uh, and this, I think, this is 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 something about art, you know. As I said, so you know, these memoirs that people churn out about, you know, how they were, you know, beaten or or hurt or or, or whatever. These are really not. I don't think we learn anything from this, you know, but. It's when there's some kind of transformation of that material, maybe that shameful or painful material, into some artistic energy that, that you have what you're looking for. And that can, I think it can take years for people to, to do it. I, I started writing something that was a kind of out of an um, early experience of mine of, you know, of being, um, what is it called? It has, in Norwegian it has the word, to be mobbed, to be um, bullied, is what the, the, the English. And, and I started working on this years and years ago, and it was just horrible. It was like so bad. And I remember I was so happy when I just threw it in the garbage and I said, you know, forget that. This has just made me feel unhappy. And I think I was too close to the material. And later, I reinvented this material in The Summer Without Men. It, it, it's comic, in a way. And I think the material works very well there. Where are we in our drama? <laughs> OK, OK, good. So we have a little more. Yes. This is really helpful. I, I'm actually coming at it as a, a reader from um, some friends asking for feedback on their work. Yes. And I'm, I'm getting some better clues. One of the things in your anecdote that was helpful was that you were just very honest when you said, I, I sense that you were very anxious about something like that. Yes. Honestly. Yes. And I'm wondering how to give better feedback to writers. Or, you know, is it, this is a very interesting question. I, I have. A position on this which is exactly this if someone gives you a manuscript I think it and, and they really they it's a not it's not a finished work you tell the truth to the best of your ability out of I think one should not read a manuscript in a way unless you're on the person's side in other words that you feel that the project is worth doing in some way if people give you a finished work I lie <laughs> it's just real to me it, this is a very simple rule the book is done here's nothing that you can do about it you just tell them thank you so much and you know congratulations and you know whatever but 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 because it's not the time to criticize something but if people really want to know or they think they want to know I think you 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 have to be honest you can do that in all kinds of you know reasonably diplomatic ways but yeah I mean this woman I mean it was just the most terribly written thing and I just I just had to say um, you know you, you seem to have you know just tremendous anxiety about your sentences because they're you know and I did a couple editing things you know I just kind of cleaned up the sentences and of course it, be, it, it becomes a whole other text right yes. so in a way I think I was called out once but precisely what you were describing earlier. Like, I just, I couldn't give my real thoughts on it, and so I pointed out crafty things, like, you know. Right. And, and I, I realized only after the fact that the, the writer, my friend, and, and I, I, I know I don't say former friend yet, but she, <laughs> she, she said, um, that's it. 
So she knew also I was not able to be honest. Right. Right, right, yeah, and I think this happens in, you know, as I said, writing workshops, I mean, people, you know, don't want to sort of go down to the real underground, and so they talk about, you know, getting rid of that adjective, or it's just all about editing the prose, and of course, as I said, that I don't think that's so hard. Thank you. Yeah. Same question, but for journalists interviewing authors and and yes. Um, any, any, because I mean, because uh, it was very interesting to me, you know, when, when someone made a comment about someone, you know, uh, an outside, so a reader, for example, seeing things that you, you didn't intend at all. Um, and yes. I do notice that often artists can be a little defensive about that. Um, uh, but I do feel that it's also fair that the, the journalist, for example, or the critic, which I'm not, we're not, but can, of course, has the right. Oh, yes. I mean, I think, you know, listen, there's also a difference between, um, you know, journalism and, and scholarship. And, and I have to say, I, I don't think, actually, actually, no, once. When I published my first novel and I read all the reviews, which I've also done for this last book because I feel it's, it's part of the project of the book, weirdly enough, but I do feel that. Um, that a Jesuit priest in something called like the Catholic Monthly mm -hmm. wrote a review of The Blindfold that I read on the subway and I, I've, I, I, I wept. He had understood aspects of that book that I hadn't seen. This is extremely rare. Um, it almost never happens. Mm -hmm. Scholars, however, sometimes you know, I've gotten like dissertations and stuff, and sometimes people see the stuff that you you go, oh wow, <laughs> you know, that's kind of creepy, but probably true, uh, and actually very interesting. So, yes, I mean, I think pe others can definitely see aspects of a work that you're not at all in tune with, and it can be extremely uh, penetrating and, and 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 very good. Would you say that it isn't a journalist's role to, to look for these things? To, to I think what journal, journalists are often looking for, if you want to be honest, uh, is that they're looking for a juicy little <laughs> tidbit about your private life. <laughs> um, I had a translation problem once in Germany. Um, I did an interview and I said something, you know, that kept pressing and pressing about my marriage. And I said, well, you know, I have a very open marriage. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went on to explain that we talked to each other, you know, we tried to talk to each other about, you know, various mm -hmm. things. And this became a headline, a huge <laughs> headline. Uh -huh. In the German papers, Siri has to apologize for having an open marriage. <laughs> this is, the, you know, I never, because what are you going to do then? Go around to journalists and say, no, that's not true, actually? You can't do that. Then it's like, you know, the lady doth protest too much. You just have to pretend, you know. But I was then, again, asked about it, actually, for the book of essays in Germany that came out, and some, you know, journalists asked me about this open marriage thing, I said, well, actually, this might be my chance <laughs> <laughs> to say that it was a, a translation issue, and I know I don't have an open marriage and never have had one. Um, so that's, I think that this is mostly what they're looking for. They're looking for you to betray yourself, and, uh, and that's not actually fun, and mo mostly at a certain level. Um, of popular journalism, that's what it's about. What should journalists ask? You know what they should ask? You know what would make every writer in the whole world really happy? Just take two sentences and say, talk about those two sentences. I've picked them out because I was particularly interested in how these two sentences work in the book as a whole, what you're talking about, what is going on, really. I think every writer would just like jump up and down and get all excited. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know, it's all about the personality, and I, I, I think that's that's a problem. Scholarship is about texts, 
you know, so therefore you can find out things. But journalism mostly is not. Now that I've jumped on journalists. Well, I see probably one of the journalist who has interviewed you. I didn't yes. write that. Right. Uh, <laughs> but how would you... I mean, the challenge for us also is to popularize it, you know, or make it. It's, it's for a general audience. Uh, of course. And this is, I have said, I did an interview for, what was it? it, was one of the big newspapers in London for this last book, and the guy who arrived what, had, has a PhD from Princeton, and we had a long talk about Margaret Cavendish and how she's been this, you know, philosopher, that natural philosopher and writer that I mentioned. And, and you know, I, I get the article, and, of course, it's just... I mean, it's, it was fine. I mean, it wasn't, you know, intrusive or anything, but it just had nothing to do with really what we talked about because he's writing for the Telegraph or something, so. Do you have a bad, like in general, do you have a lot of bad experiences with, with No, not a lot, but some for sure. And of course, you know, you can do an interview, it's perfectly fine, and then you look at what the person wrote and you're just shocked. That can happen. You know, you realize that, you know, they've, they've taken your comments out of context. You know, they're really cruel. Um, it's, you know, it's not, I can honest, honestly say I've never done anything like that in my life to another person in, in public. How do you ask political questions? Because now Europe, you know, is... You know. Sometimes I am. You know, uh, European journalists ask writers questions about politics, whether they're very well informed or not, to be honest. Um, uh, Americans don't do that. It's because the position of the writer has a certain grandeur in Europe that it doesn't have here. <laughs> I think, yeah. Are you out of gas? No. <laughs> if you are. Yeah. I just don't want to keep opening up topics. There's so many. But um, let me open this up. Okay. <laughs> You're now sort of um, crossing over into the threshold of um, the mind body and yeah. neurology and the brain mm -hmm. and um, the therapeutic world. And so I'm curious how your perspective and creativity is shaped by that. Yeah. I, th I think it is. You know, I mean, I have a sort of, I have a double life in a way now, more active, but I mean, I've always been an obsessive reader, and for about, I guess, 15 years now, I've been really immersed in neuroscience. I have a very good working knowledge of neuroscience, and of course, what happens, you know, the more you know, the more critical you become. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you start to see flaws in certain kinds of thinking. I've been reading analytical philosophy that I never read before. Again, I have a lot of criticism of it, but it's been fascinating. My idea about, you know, the mind is I, I, I know that I have a better mind now than I've ever had. And part of it is simply experience. And I also think that I have spent a lot of time reading against myself. This is a this is really important. You know, I read things that are really alien to my temperament. Yeah. And it 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 actually broadens your horizons. In what way could you say so for example, symbolic logic. I remember I started reading symbolic logic when I was a graduate student and 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 I just thought, "Oh, this is crap." <laughs> you know, I don't want to do this. This is horrible. And um and in a way it is, and I still am much more of a, you know, have, have much more affinity with continental thinking, but by, by understanding the arguments in this analytical tradition, I've been able to understand how to place my own arguments in a much broader context. And this is great. It also, by the way, speaking of novels, you can, you, you can inhabit the voices of these people. You know, you get a wider range of characters who can, you know, pop up on the stage because suddenly you have this this diction, this whole way of thinking in your mind. Um, this, you know, the last book, the Harriet Burden book, is also in that book. There's an ongoing argument about the mind-body problem, 
and computational theory of mind versus organicist theories. It's really in there. Now, you don't have to pay attention to it. You can still see, the, you know, read the book without caring about that, but, but it's in there. And, um, and that's fun. And so I think all of this is grist for the mill. You know, as I said, everything you read becomes part of you, or everything you have an emotional relation to. Uh, and wanting to know is an emotional kind of relationship, right? You want to know. I mean, I would like to know everything. I know that I can't. I know that's ridiculous. But, but that's sort of the, the, that's the fantasy. What was your graduate book in? English literature. I got a PhD and I wrote on Dickens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. To go back to the question about the kind of the role of the, the author in America and Europe, um, I mean, we, how do you feel about the culture we live in and the role or what a, a writer can? Well, the discourse is pretty change. low, you know? The discourse is pretty low. Uh, I think. Uh, we're, we, and this is partly because we really are creatures of repetition. Um, perception is shaped by context. Uh, you know, perception is conservative, you know, because it's about past experience. You know, it's creative. We're always filling in the blanks of any perceptual object. And, um, and I think, you know, I, even if you go back to the 1950s and look at book reviews, even in this country, what you'd call middle-brow book reviews, you'll find a higher level of literacy and a higher level of thought than you find now. Uh, this could be the decline of the book, uh, but... Uh, <coughs> No, so so that, so I I just, I mean I think in general the discourse is, is 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 in popular culture the discourse is pretty damn low, and um, it would be nice if we could bring it up just a little bit. It's time. Oh. On that sad note. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.